Hello, it's Greg Otten here with MaritimeGardening.com. I've got this uh, thing on here because, uh, not because it's cold, it's, it's about 19 degrees Celsius out today, room temperature, but the flies are pretty bad. I'll move my face a little closer here because they're drawn to it, but I think you can see that there's a lot of flies <laughs> out here today with me. It's actually, uh, you got to breathe very carefully or you'll breathe flies. Anyway, just thought I'd show you a couple things out here today. I'm going to do this fairly quickly because, as you can tell, it's uh, not pleasant <laughs> out here right now. Uh, this time of year, I do most of my gardening. Uh, I find the black flies, and black flies are worse than mosquitoes, I find. Uh, the mosquitoes come along later in the year. But um, I do my gardening in the morning, very early. Like, I'll come outside at 5.30 in the morning or 6 and uh, do a little bit of work. I mean, I have, I have a day job I gotta commute and drive to and stuff like that. So I find it nice to come out around 5.30 in the morning and uh, do a bit of work before I, I, you know, put on my fancy clothes and go to work and that sort of thing. Um, but also, there's no black flies out. Black flies have this weird thing this time of year, mid-May to late May, where they uh, they show up around uh, 8.30 in the morning and they disappear around 8.30 at night. So it's kind of uh, nice in a sense because you can look forward to that. Like Mosquitoes keep going all night long, so if you're outside, especially if you're sleeping outside, it's really bad. Mosquitoes. At least the black flies leave, right? At least you've got that. They got about a 12-hour window of time and then it gets too cold for them and they go away. So uh, I'll come out early in the morning and do that. And if I've got a bit of energy, I'll come out around 8.30 at night and uh, uh, work out here till dark. I actually had a real zen moment a couple nights ago. And you know, I don't, I've never taken a meditation class or anything like that. I don't know the first thing about that, but I would imagine from what I've read, what people have told me, uh, I had a similar sort of experience where I was out here and the sun was setting, the sun had gone past the horizon, but you could still see it was twilight. And I could hear uh, loons off in the, there's a lake back that way, about a kilometer or so. I could hear loons singing in the lake. I could hear the peepers <whistles> making their sounds. Um, I could hear different animals off in the woods. And I was just, I could just barely see, there was just enough light to work. And I was just planting potatoes, and I wasn't really thinking about what I was doing. I was just, just almost, uh, just really had a, a time there where I was just in the moment and uh, just a perfect moment when I think about it now. Uh, it's nice when that sort of thing happens. Anyway, come around, I'm going to show you a couple interesting things I noticed uh, uh, this morning when I was looking around my garden. Um, mostly bad news, but that's part of it, right? I mean, the great thing about uh, I, I'm not a garden guru. I mean, I, I don't make a living doing this. I just do this because I enjoy uh, the teaching aspect of it. I enjoy uh, sharing my observations with other people. And uh, I basically talk about things that I wish there was someone talking about to me. <laughs> That's really what I came up with why I do this channel. Um, so I'm perfectly comfortable showing you where things go wrong because everybody has things go wrong. I don't think it's very useful if um, you just watch me and everything I do is awesome. Uh, then you're going to feel like there's something wrong with you when things don't go right with you. Uh, I, you know, things, things, uh, having things go wrong isn't a problem. Not being able to diagnose what the problem is, that's a problem. Not knowing what to do when things go wrong, that's a problem. Or not being proactive uh, when you see things going wrong and doing something about it right away, just watching things decline, uh, that's a problem. So uh, today I'm going to talk about a couple problems and what I'm going to do about them, all right? So uh, have a watch. All right, so here's problem number one. I don't know if you can see my fence there, but see how it's sort of bent, right? Let me zoom this up a little bit. The top, right along there, is bent. Notice the adjacent section, not bent, straight line. This one's got a bend in it. And the one next to it has got a pronounced bend. If we look over here, this section, right, the straight line. Straight line. So, why is that bent? Right? Well, what I noticed 
in one of the adjacent garden beds was deer tracks. My fence are four feet high and uh, it's not like the deer jumped clean over it. It looks like it sort of got tangled up in it and uh, the fence bore its weight and that's why it's bent down like that. It was actually bent down even a little bit more when I saw it. I tried to straighten it out. I'm gonna have to put another stake in there and really try to pull it back up. Anyway, so I got gear deer in here and um, there was a video where I oh, I just got a black fly in my mouth. Um, there was a video out here where I uh, planted some um, uh, peas early in the year and it uh, looks like they ate some of those um, so uh, that's a problem and uh, really the electric fence thing isn't going to work here it's uh, number one it's very far from the house so I'd have to use a battery one number two it's, it's always foggy and wet and humid here and especially in the mornings and uh, I would have to be there's like on the outside of the fence it's all it's all bushes and stuff out there so there would be wet stuff that's in contact with the ground touching the fence all the time and uh, for the cost and the time and the energy I don't really think it would really run that. I, mean, I have to be feeding it batteries all the time so uh, I'll have to come up with another solution. I mean the deer have not been back since that's the case but you know if they come in here and they find food and they like it they're gonna keep coming back uh, so I'm thinking of putting barbed wire across the top to tell you the truth because I think uh, if they come into contact with that um, I think they'll regret it. I think for about 90 bucks I can get all kinds of barbed wire and uh, yeah I don't think they have the wherewithal to put a blanket over it like you see in those prison break movies <laughs> so <laughs> I think that's a cheap simple sustainable solution um, I think they'll it'll hurt them a little bit and then they'll just avoid it and go around it uh, so this is uh, year uh, I think three with this fence and this is the first time I've had it bent like that um, so that, you know it took them three years to, to have a go at getting over there and this fence thing you know, I've watched a lot of uh, video content, people talking about their permaculture gardens and about sort of cooperating and going hand in hand with nature. And I love the beauty of that concept. And I try to do that here. But uh, I can't speak to all contexts and all ecosystems. <laughs> oh my God. But certainly where this one's the case, um, it's it's everything against you. No, no. <laughs> Certainly in this case, uh, my experience here is that if something finds its way into my garden and starts eating my vegetables, it keeps coming back and keeps coming back until it's taken everything. Um, it, it's never the case that the animals sort of cooperate with me and take a little bit and leave some. They take, if they like something, they take all of it. They come, they eat until they're full and they come back the next day and eat until they're full. And they just keep doing that until it's all gone doesn't matter what the plant is. Um, so I have to keep them out. That's the only way to deal with that is to keep them out. If they find their way in, I have to be vigilant until I've figured out a way to prevent them, uh, dissuade them from coming in. All right, so here's a bed, uh, which I started with one of those, had one of those domes over it. And it's got spinach and kale growing in it. And kale is my own variety of saved seeds and the spinach is a variety that was provided by Vessi Seed. I can't recall the, the actual variety. They both came on really well and they both grew really well. And then uh, we had a nice warm day once and I took the uh, a dome off. And then I left the dome off for a few days. And those two nights it got down, not even to frost, it got below freezing those two nights. And uh, the spinach can take that and uh, when, when it's mature kale is pretty tough but I think in this baby form I don't think this particular variety can can take that. I'm gonna move the camera a bit closer here because uh, the kale has been utterly decimated ever since that. So if you look here you can see it's it's being uh, that looks like flea beetle damage to me there's these tiny little dots. I don't know if you can see that. See how the, the surface has got all these little dimples and tiny holes and stuff? That's flea beetle damage as far as I know. Anyway, they're, they're all sick and pathetic looking and uh, they just don't uh, 
they just don't look good they don't look healthy to me and uh, they might come back and they might recover but uh, honestly in my opinion when you have a young plant and these caudal leaves get damaged uh, the damage that does to the plant in terms of its overall life span I think is a little too much so uh, I'm not going to sit back and watch this. I mean, it's it's mid-May already. It's close to mid-May. Um, this whole bed, I'm going to replant all those rows. I just don't like the way the, the kale look. They look all messed up and sick. So you can see the spinach. Uh, it looks nice and healthy, right? Nice looking spinach. No damage. No twisted deformities or anything like that. All the kale... has this, see that? It's all deformed and, and just crappy looking, right? This doesn't look good. Doesn't look good to me. And uh, I, I just, I think it's just worth cutting the losses. You know, it came in so well and it looked so good. But I think what happened, I don't think it's got anything to do with the soil, because look how, look how beautiful the spinach looks, right? That's another good reason to plant two things in a bed, right? I think really the difference between the spinach and the kale is that spinach really, really is an early plant and likes cold. And kale can take cold, but when it's a seedling, I have found, generally speaking, that kale seedlings do not like cold. Not the kind of cold we get here. Um, I find it's better to keep them protected. Uh, so I'm just going to rip these all out and replant and plant, uh, I might even plant some more of the Vessi seeds at kale. Now, how am I so confident about this? Uh, aside from the fact that I've been doing this for years. Um, let me show you something over here. So here's one of my cold frames. And uh, I lost a lot of kale in here because it was, uh, number one, I've, I've, put, I've picked some and moved it to another bed. I'm trying to move everything out of this cold frame because I want to try to grow um, uh, eggplant in here. But I left some in. This is the exact same variety of kale as that one back there. Okay. The difference is that it's been in this cold frame since it was planted. And it was planted quite a long time ago. Right? But look how healthy. No damage, no nothing. It's strong and healthy. Right? Because it hasn't been exposed to the elements. <laughs> Even though I started them in March out here, right, it's been under this lid. And it's just a, a little kind of protected microclimate here. From the plant's point of view, it's been growing here in Zone 7, not Zone 6. So, I mean, there are some, like, see how this one's been eaten? There's a slug or something or a snail in here that's doing some damage. But uh, not enough to take the whole plant out. But the kale that are growing in here look great. And it's the exact same variety as that one I, I planted direct seeded in that other bed. The difference is that the uh, uh, that other bed was exposed to extreme temperatures at a very young state. And... Uh, that, in combination with the presence of, see when this one was young, even though it might have been exposed to some temperature extremes, there was no flea beetles, <laughs> right? So um, even though it might have been, let's say it was weakened or a bit by the, by the cold, because certainly it was cold in March, uh, there was nothing out here attacking it, right? Where there's all kinds of things crawling around the soil that attack plants now. So it's not worth worrying about. It's not a big problem. I just did something dumb. And I lost an entire bed of kale as a result of it. So you just replant and move on with your life. <laughs> That's it. Also, if you look in here, you can see the kale growing here. Um, let me move this in a bit. It's doing great, right? Beautiful kale. Nice and high. Again, what's the difference? Hasn't been exposed to uh, ice. <laughs> minus one, minus two been in this box with the lid on since it was planted in March so you know this is a lot of kale that's growing here I mean once each one of these I've got these planted you know maybe two two or three inches apart from one another but they need to be spaced out so they're almost over a foot apart from one another so a lot of these will be moved out into beds in the bigger garden and uh, I can probably fill a couple four by ten gardens with just with what's in here and it's a beautiful looking kale. It's supposed to be, uh, I think it's called Black Magic. It's supposed to be analogous to uh, a Lacinato kale in terms of flavor and texture and so on, but better suited to the climate here in uh, eastern Canada. Um, this is zone 6 where I am, zone 6A. 
So we'll see. Uh, it's my first experience of using this uh, variety from Vessi Seeds. But uh, if it works out, if it's got the flavor of a Lassanato kale, which is an incredible uh, flavor, um, then uh, I'm definitely sold. Anyway, these kale look great, right? Why? Because the lid's on at night. <laughs> Even though it's middle of May, it's, it still gets very cold. Um, I was out uh, camping in the woods two nights ago, and uh, there was uh, ice in the, one of my cups when I woke up in the morning. So, still getting cold. Anyway, just a quick little video showing you uh, a couple uh, epic fail. <laughs> Not an epic fail. Stuff like this happens to me every year. Uh, usually the main problem is that I get overzealous. I do something a bit too early. You know, I push the, push the edge of uh, what the plants can take. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. I had, um, I find spinach also doesn't like being frozen. It doesn't mind a bit of frost, but it can't take being frozen. Not spinach, um, sorry. Um, Swiss chard. It can't take the cold as well as spinach. So I have another bed where I, I took the lid off and, uh, and the Swiss chard took a bit of a beating from the cold as well, but it seems to have, I lost some of them, but, but uh, I would say 50% seem to have made it through that. So. Uh, again, it was me just taking my domes off a bit early and being a bit, a bit, uh, a bit ambitious. Every year is different. You just never know uh, what it's going to be like. But certainly, there's plenty of Mays where we've had, you know, uh, ice and freezing temperatures. In fact, yeah, I was born in the middle of May and it snowed on my birthday. And I'm 45 and I think it snowed on my birthday at least three or four times in my lifetime. Um, so yeah, it can, it can be cold in May, right? You can get snow in May in uh, Nova Scotia. So uh, you got to be careful. It, only the toughest plants can be exposed uh, this time of year with no plastic over them, unless you're in some unique little microclimate where uh, it's a bit warmer. But where I am here on a sort of a high point near the ocean and stuff like that, it, you get a lot of frost and a lot of cold. Um, so that happens. Anyway, I thought uh, that would be interesting to share with you. Uh, it's, it's, it's great to show off your success, but uh, I think it's also very instructional and very useful to uh, share your, your, just when things go wrong and talk through how you're going to deal with that. So I hope you found that interesting. I hope that gave you some good ideas and I hope that helps you. Uh, if you enjoyed this content, please um, like, subscribe, bell, all that stuff. Uh, check out my podcast, MaritimeGardening.com. Uh, check out the offers from my sponsors in the description box below. And until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun with you guys. Thanks for watching.